Let's pray together. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and open our eyes so that we may see. Open our ears so that we may hear. Open our minds so that we may understand. And open our hearts so that we may receive whatever it is that you have for us today. For we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm not a big fan of radishes. Some people love them. I, however, am not one of those people. Now and again, someone will serve me a salad with beautifully thin sliced radishes laying across the bed of greens. And when they pick the plate up, all the greens will be gone. For those slices of radish will still be on the plate. Radishes are just one of those foods that I've never developed a taste for. But radishes have been on my mind this week, not because of their color or texture or flavor, and not because I haven't been sitting around all week stewing over them. Radishes have been on my mind because I've been thinking about prayer and the radical life-changing power, world-changing power that is within it. You see, prayer is the most radical thing that we can do. The word radical comes from the Latin word radix, where we get our word radish. And it simply means root. You know, the root is the invisible part of the plant that gives it its life and strength. In prayer, it's the hidden and invisible part of our relationship with God that gives us our life and strength. As disciples, as the disciples spent time with Jesus, as they watched him preach the good news, heal the sick, cast out demons, feed the hungry masses, they noticed that what set him apart, what truly set him apart, was his intimate relationship with the Father, a relationship he nurtured through a life of prayer. Over and over again in the gospel, we read of Jesus, either getting up early in the morning and going out into a deserted place to pray or spending all night in prayer on top of a mountain. The disciples found Jesus' prayer life so remarkable that the one thing they asked Jesus to teach them to do was to pray. They didn't ask Jesus to teach them how to preach, didn't teach, ask him to teach them how to raise the dead or cast out demons. Didn't ask them to teach them how to do the thing with the multiplying the bread and the fish. The only thing the disciples asked Jesus to teach them was to pray. They asked Jesus to teach them to pray because they understood that if they knew how to connect and communicate with God in prayer, they would be able to tap into a limitless source of power and strength. Now you can find the place where the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. It says this, He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples asked him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. Do not bring us into the time of trial. When the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray, he gives them what we know today as the Lord's Prayer. Now, you might have noticed that the version of the Lord's prayer that Jesus gives here is slightly different than the one that is traditionally used in, in churches and in homes around the world. The version of the Lord's Prayer that we, that we usually, or that most people are familiar with, comes from two sources. One is in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, and the other is from an early Christian handbook called the Didache. Now that word Didache is an ancient Greek word that simply means teaching or instruction. And the document known as the Didache is a first or 
second century discipleship manual. It's one of the oldest Christian writings we have outside the books of the Bible. In it, we discover that the practice of the early, prayer, early church was to pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day. First thing in the morning, at some point during midday, and then again in the evening before retiring for the night. Since the earliest days of the Jesus movement, prayer, prayer has been the source of life and power from which all the great things that God has done through the years has flowed. It's been the source of life and power for the church as a whole and for individual followers of Jesus. My hope and prayer is that over the next several weeks as we spend time uh, exploring the Lord's Prayer, that we will both personally as individuals and collectively as a whole church body, be filled with the peace, joy, power that God offers, that God offers to any and to all who tap into the life-giving root that is prayer. Now, I, I, I know at times prayer can seem mysterious or challenging or difficult, but it doesn't have to be. In fact, the best way to learn to pray is by simply beginning to pray. One of the great spiritual writers of the 20th century was a Trappist monk named Thomas Merton. He lived at an abbey in Kentucky known as the Gethsemane. In one of his marvelous books on prayer, he wrote this, the great thing is prayer, prayer itself. If you want a life of prayer, the way to get it is by praying. You start where you are, and you deepen what you already have. It's always great to remember that prayer doesn't have to be complicated. God has already shown us how to communicate with Him. And what's best for us to remember is to keep it simple, keep it real, and keep it up. Bill Hybels was the longtime pastor of a church outside of Chicago. He shares the story of a, an advertising executive who, who found Christ in his church and was visiting with, with the pastor one day in his office and was making all sorts of excuses about why he just didn't have time to pray. That's fine for you, Bill, he said. Your, your job is to sit and to listen. I'm very busy. I've got so much going on. I don't have time to sit and do nothing. The pastor gently pushed back against the executive's complaint with a gentle challenge. You know, he said, I've always found, managed to make time for the things that I really value. And so this new believer in Christ went and bought himself a really, really nice rocking chair. And he sat in front of a window in his house and began to get up just 20 minutes earlier every day to sit in it, to read the Bible. And to pray. And as he maintained this simple rhythm, his wife and colleagues began to notice that he was becoming less scattered, more peaceful, kinder. The rocking chair became the place where he would meet God in prayer. Months turned into years. Daily discipline became a holy habit. And then one morning as he sat listening and ro rocking in his chair and listening for God's voice, the Lord invited him to quit his job, sell the family home, relocate his entire family from Chicago to Colorado and begin to help a church that could really use his expertise. It was a life-changing moment that launched his entire family into a new and fruitful season of life. Several years later, he was diagnosed with an aggressive and incurable form of cancer. But he continued to keep his appointment with God each morning in that chair. And during his last remaining days, he found the strength and the peace and even the joy and courage in prayer for the hardest transition of them all. On the day of the funeral, a friend of the family came and found the grieving widow 
gazing at that rocking chair. What are you going to do with that chair now, he asked. She replied, oh, we're going to, we're going to keep it and we're going to pass it down to the children and to the grandchildren. I love to think of them sitting in that chair the way my husband did, unburdening their hearts, listening to the Lord and allowing Jesus to shape and direct their lives. I hope this summer you will make time for the most valuable thing there is in all the world. Time connecting and communicating with the one Jesus invites us to call our Father. To help us do that, we are encouraging everyone to take advantage of a great resource called the prayer course. I hope you'll find two or three other people to go through the course with so that you can explore the numerous prayer resources available there. In the coming weeks, we'll be sharing information about some special prayer events that we'll, we will be hosting. And I hope that you will make it a priority. You will make the time to come and join your church family in prayer. Now this morning, I want us to conclude not by talking about prayer, but by actually spending time in prayer. The best way to learn to pray is to pray. And there's no better way in using the very words that Jesus gave us here in Luke chapter 11. I'll lead you through the Lord's Prayer line by line and invite you to spend the next few moments resting in God's presence, listening for the leading of the Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Be still. Sit quietly and ask, where is the evidence of the Father's love in my life right now? As you become aware of the myriad ways that God has poured his love into your life, give thanks. Give thanks and praise God's holy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What would it look like for God's kingdom to come in the three circles of your life today? I invite you to pray for your own needs. To pray for the needs of your family and friends. pray for the wider world. Give us this day our daily bread. So what is your takeaway from our time together today? What has most resonated with you in the songs or the scripture or the message or the prayer? Treat that word or phrase or idea as a starting point for a conversation with God. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Review the last 24 hours, allowing the Holy Spirit to challenge any sinful thoughts, words, or deeds. Are there people to whom you need to apologize? Or others you need to forgive? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Ask for God's protection for yourself and for those you love, especially in any areas of vulnerability that you might have. If you feel as if you are under spiritual attack, take authority, standing in the relevant promises from the Bible. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I wonder what might happen if you spent just a few minutes in prayer like that every day this summer. I wonder how your experience of God's love and power and grace and, and healing and peace 
might become manifest in your life. I wonder what might happen if this summer we committed ourselves to being a community of radical prayer. I suspect that we would see what every group, every church has seen when they committed themselves to the Lord in prayer. We would see lives changed, marriages saved, addictions broken, new people discovering the freedom and forgiveness that God has shown us in Jesus. Why pray? Because it changes everything.